you won the best documentary, right, at the Tacoma Film Festival? Yes, we did. Um, <laughs> that was very um, unexpected and very exciting. <laughs> yes. And it's, um, we were talking on the way over here, uh, making a film is one thing and then promoting it and being on a festival circuit can just be exhausting. Um, author flew in this morning uh, from LA and with us tonight, now gonna be in New Haven on the 25th, back on the West Coast in San Francisco, uh, and then New York City in November 4, and again in California. So it's just, it, it's a real ride, isn't it? <laughs> it is, but it's exciting. I mean, you know, we love sharing the movie that we've been making for 13 years at this point. Um, and actually, Philip also just had an even longer flight. Where did he fly from? Uh, I came in from Nigeria on Saturday. Yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so it's um, really great that the timing just really worked out for, uh, for us to be able to be here together. It's the first time we're seeing the film together. Um, all the participants have seen the film individually and shared it with their families. But this is really special because you know we're in the same room, the same space, and watching it with an audience also kind of is a very different experience. Yeah. So we've got one more. Hello, so hello. Just... Okay. Uh, so actually, um, I'm curious. Did you watch the film with your family when you were home in Zimbabwe? Yes. Okay. Uh, Nigeria. In, in my case, it's in Nigeria. Oh, Nigeria. Uh, sorry. No, no problem at all. I, I watched it last week with my mom. Um, there were parts of it that definitely brought her to tears. Just the whole thing of having to reflect over the last couple of years, um, ways in which coming to the, the U.S. being at MIT and the fact that the family in such positive ways uh, was just a lot for her actually. You know? And so yeah, um, that was my own experience watching my mom last week. Was it the Was it the first time that you had been home since? Um this uh, uh, since graduating from MIT? No, I've been home. I'd, when I finished, I planned to just like go yearly. That was the original plan. That hasn't really materialized, but I've been going more often now. Okay. Um, this would be my fourth time since I graduated. Mm -hmm. So four time, fourth time in eight years. So every two years has mm -hmm. been the average so far. And, um, sorry, and uh, how, how do you feel that you fit in now when you return to Nigeria? Because you're visiting there, you live here now. Um, how do, do you feel like a visitor? Not really. I, in Nigeria, I still, I still kind of just blend in, to be honest. Okay. You know, you come back, you still speak the language, you can still speak the Nigerian street lingo. So <laughs> let's say after the first two, three days, I'm like blending in. And, and fitting in as, 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 as if not much has been changed. But I mean, there's been concrete ways in which the US has changed me. And so, like, I don't go to the market to try to price things myself anymore because, you know, I don't know how it is well priced and you have to handle the prices and whatnot. And yeah. I've you lost mean, that skill. You need to haggle? Yeah. Haggle. No, I don't have it. <laughs> okay. So, just, just a small example, but like, on a more serious note, um, I mean, there have been concrete ways that being in the U.S. has changed the way I see and do things. Mm -hmm. That's a bit different from how things are done back home. Mm -hmm. And so those are ways, that, like, those are some of the things I've noticed. Um, yeah, it's kind of awesome. And Philip, um, what are some of the tangible ways in which you're, you've been able to help your family, uh, your brothers and sisters and your mother? Yeah, um, I can give a couple of examples. My immediate younger brother is here in the U.S. right now, pursuing his master's. And so that's been a direct result of me being here, being able to work in the U.S. and support the family. Um, my immediate younger ones are all in colleges at the moment. Um, they all schooled in Nigeria. One schooled in Nigeria, the other two are in Ghana. I'm schooling at the moment. And um, it's all been possible because I'm here in the U.S. I'm working. I'm able to like help the family out in that way. Um, amongst other things, there are businesses that my mom does now that's quite different from what we were doing eight, ten years ago. And so that those are just some examples. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So life life is very encouraging for your entire family because of this experience at MIT. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Arthur, 
I know you wanted to make a film, and you made it. <laughs> but uh, did this end up being uh, therapy for you as well as making a film? No, your mic's working. Hello. We're good. Okay. Cool. Thank you for that. Um, was it therapy? Um, I guess it was a space to maybe reflect on things. I sensed that I needed to figure some things out, um, but I maybe did not know exactly what questions to ask. In some ways, for example, um, you know, for a long time, the we had the edit process took five years, um, and we had multiple editors um, come on at different times. And um, Kelly Creedon, um, you know, finished the film and, and created this beautiful space where it finally all came together. Um, but for a long time, I I saw it as a film about um, the four participants, right? And so even though sometimes people would suggest that, you know, maybe you should try putting yourself in there. I couldn't really figure out why, what my role in it would be. Um, and so just watching in the edit, um, realizing how the power of the vulnerability that Philip and the three um, other participants um, had given, you know, watching that power enabled me to see that there was power and vulnerability. And also, you know, with, you know, when the bill was introduced in Ghana, I realized that started me thinking about, um, you know, that awkwardness I feel when I, when I go to Ghana, it takes me a little bit longer to really f find my footing and, and feel at ease. And it had to do with um, needing to turn away from Ghana in order to kind of be more my, myself. And so, you know, editing and, and reacting to the world and kind of considering what Philip and Billy and Santi and, and Fidelis have given us in, in the filming of the, in the creation of the film, um, kind of, I guess, helped me realize what questions I wanted to address within myself. And so I guess in some ways it was therapy or maybe a space to reflect um, on, on some things. The scene in the car, um, I think it's Fidelis that turns the camera, uh, well, not the camera, but the questions on you. To me, as, as um, watching that film, there was such authenticity in that. And, and it was like, you, at that point, it was like you had the opportunity to like deflect, but it was like, it just opened this conversation where you became the fifth participant. And I thought it was really beautiful how it was edited. Yeah, those moments always, you know, in the five years when I was resisting being, or I couldn't see a way that I not organically belonged in the film, those moments st stood out, you know, the conversations that we would have across the camera. And we had those conversations, or had those conversations with all the participants. Um, I, I think when I started, I really thought I'd be a fly on the wall as a filmmaker, and I didn't really want to disturb what they were going through, just kind of like, follow them and capture it. But then I think as I matured as a filmmaker, um, I understood that even when you're not in the film, you are in the film or you are affecting the situation. And so just kind of embracing that um, and leaning into what was organically happening in the relationships that we were building together. Um, and also accepting that it was a collaboration. You know, so all the participants filmed video diaries as well which was initially a way, you know, when we started the film, I was in LA and, you know, they were busy kind of adjusting to MIT and um, starting this exciting life. So I would come um, here, film for a few weeks, crash on Stan's couch, Stan is in the back over there. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, in the film, but then when I went away, it was a way to kind of keep um, the story going and, and captured and so all the participants, um, created video diaries and those became a powerful component of the film. And so in a way we were holding each other and kind of exploring this experience together. It was nicely woven in many of the diary uh, 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 journal uh, excerpts. Have you shown the film in Ghana? No, no, not yet. <laughs> um, Ghana's bill has not passed yet, so it's still possible. Um, so, you know, currently we're just, this is our, fifth film festival, um, all in the U.S. so far. And so, you know, there's like 
waiting for the international premiere, um, trying to you know see which festivals say yes to it, and then roll it out um, all over the continent. Um, I was hoping we would have our international premiere or at least an African premiere um, at AFRIF, which also showed, they played Niger Veda, but um, they just rejected us. And, I, and I, I, I think it has to do with, there are places um, on the continent where there are already laws that um, would make screening the film, particularly with its, the, the queer storyline, perhaps problematic. Um, and so for a very high profile film festival, I suspect that, um, there are challenges with, with screening that even when there are, um, you know, even if the programming commi committee might be supportive. So it might be challenging in some spaces, but we will get it seen. Okay. And, and for the audience, that film festival that you were speaking about is where? Oh, that's in, in Lagos, Nigeria. Lagos, Nigeria. It's a great film festival. Um, we had a great experience, saw amazing films that were being done, created on, on the continent, everything from animation to, action to drama to period pieces it was incredible i highly recommend checking it out when you were making the film uh, it took such a long period of time and also you had to do a lot of fundraising to make it happen was there ever a, a point in time where you felt like it was just overwhelming and it would not be finished <laughs> i i did feel overwhelmed um many times um but i knew i had to get it done um because i made a commitment to philip and to sante and billy and to fidelis and their families um and i feel like i felt like i had to honor that and so you know when we were fundraising and then i realized just how much money would would be needed to kind of hire the experienced editors and, and um, you know, and all the professionals to kind of build the product post production and complete it. It was um, it was really overwhelming. <laughs> there were a couple of years where I was just kind of editing myself, and I would take you know basically save up all my vacation from work and you know even take unpaid time to just kind of create a new rough cut and reapply to like all the the funding sources. But eventually, you know, they came through. Um, that and, and once they came through, um, they, they have been incredible partners. They really helped us kind of um, staff up the way this film deserved and needed to be staffed up. So I'm very grateful to ITBS, to Sundance, the Sandbox Fund, um, DCTV. I mean, so many organizations used all the credits. And in the meantime, we had, you know, the Kickstarter and the grassroots community that, that really carried this film and kept kept encouraging us to keep going you know um there are several people out here um who supported the film over the 10 years um before kind of the industry came on board so thank you all and then pov with um uh uh, uh, uh the television station here sorry uh yes thank you pbs um they only choose about 13 or 14 films, I understand, per year, and your film has been chosen, right? That's correct. So that was, um, that was an incredible um, breakthrough or um, validation, I guess, of our, of our stories in a way. But it was also exciting because it means, you know, at least a million people will see it in the U.S. And, you know, um, POV is a great um, organization. Uh, we've been working with them for a few months now on different aspects of you know, um, they line up plans to engage uh, for audience engagement. They work with community partners. Um, they're they're creating a, a discussion guide so that schools and students um, and educational spaces can actually um, use the film um, in an educational setting. So um, it, they're incredible partners. But yes, they do pick this year. This season is sixteen films, sixteen wonderful films. I highly recommend checking them out if you don't you know, watch them. Um, they give you an incredible perspective of stories from all around the world, the beautiful films. Philip, do you still stay in touch with the other uh, the other people uh, that were shot in the film? Um, yeah, we, we are all still in touch, although not very often, except Fidelis. Fidelis and I have uh, been very close. Um, he lives like 15 minutes away from me. So we meet other ones in a while and catch up. 
this wonderful and are you feeling like you have created a bit more of a community here uh, oh thank you thanks okay so i'm just wondering if you know uh fidelis is 15 minutes away and you've been here now and living working do you feel like you have like a community here now that you can feel secure and uh, connected? Yeah, yeah. I definitely feel, um, I think over time I became, I felt more at home here in the U.S. Um, that didn't happen overnight, though. It was like um, a combination of different things happened. I'm married. I have a, I have a kid now. We all live together out in law. And so that's helped me, at, at least, you know, having my family here uh, goes a long way. Having my brother here helps too. So what I realized for me is I think part of that discomfort was just coming from me being the only one in my family in the U.S. So as more and more people from my own immediate family move over, it just increases my, my level of comfort. Um, but um, to answer your question directly, yes, I have community, even within the MIT, community there are friends around um, in Atlanta I have people out there too that I that I know well and I can easily just like plug into whenever I visit. That's good to hear. Yeah. I'm wondering now that you've been able to help your family and there are so many you know of your siblings that are moving into college and getting out once you achieve those goals of of helping family do you think you'll do you, you have thoughts of whether you'll return um, or will you stay? Absolutely. So um, sometimes, this, this is something my friends and I still talk about. I know that we'd say what, I, what I've always been after here in the U.S. is access. I want access to the U.S. because I think there are opportunities here that I can't find in a lot of other places. But what I want to be do, able to do with that access is impact the places where I grew up. Um, I, so the summary of it is I'm actually running a startup right now. It's a financial tech startup. It's going to be when we launch, we'll be targeting Nigerians and like solving problems that people in Nigeria face when receiving money from the U.S. and so on. So a lot of the things that I've been doing, even post-graduation from MIT, is still within that space of, OK, how do I use the opportunities I have here in the U.S. to improve things back home? through like technology or any other means I can do, yeah. I want to open it up to the audience. Um, and I have a question can right I here. Ask, can I ask you, Philip, why do you suppose, first, uh, it's a visa question with two parts. Did you go to MIT and say, can you help my mother get, can you do anything about the fact my mother's visa was denied? And then why was your visa denied? Yeah, so for the first one, we did write a letter to MIT, but it's one of those things where there's not much they can really do. It ultimately comes down to the actual interviewer, and the outcome can be quite arbitrary. An example is my immediate younger brother made it to the U.S. this year, but that was after his third trial at visa interviews. And so sometimes we, we, we don't really know how the decisions are made. So, but, so your question, we did try, but it didn't help. As for my own visa, the reason why I didn't get it was because it was a lottery process. So everybody, every international student in the US gets three trials um, after their first degree. Um, and when, when I say three trials, it means if you study in a STEM-related field, you have um, three years to be able to work. And within that three-year window, your employer can apply. But since it's a lottery, there is no guarantee. So in my own case, I had three trials. My name didn't get picked in the lottery, so I had to go to school to extend my stay. And it's all worked out eventually. I'm a permanent resident now. Um, yeah, so it, it all worked out well. <laughs> After walking all that. Where do you live and where are you working? <laughs> Okay, yes, I, I live here in Mass. Um, I recently moved to Lowell, Lowell Mass. Um, I worked, I was at AWS, Amazon Web Services, as a software engineer, um, but now I'm, I'm running my own startup. Yeah. 
Yes. Do we have any? Yes. Hi. Uh, so first of all, congratulations. Uh, Thank you. It's a beautiful story and it is making so many friends. My question to uh, Professor is more about like, the selection process. Like, how did you pick those four in the middle? Uh, I'm very curious about that. Um, how, how did this happen? And also, uh, my question to you maybe is if you don't mind me, if you don't mind sharing, how is your mental health? Like, if you talk about that, your mental health. Mental, mental health. health. Okay. So the first question is for you, author, how you picked the students that are featured in the film? Yes. Thank you for that reaction. Um, we, so when I, I basically approached the um, MIT admissions office with the idea back in 2011, um, and they couldn't give me names. Um, uh, so my criteria were I wanted to film with people that were coming directly from the African continent. Um, and beyond that, um, I also wanted to make sure that uh, the participants I was working with kind of could take the project in, in their stride. And so if I was, if anybody was, you know, looking like, you know, they were having a difficulty scheduling, um, requests to film, you know, I didn't want that to be a distraction. So basically, the MIT admissions office um, was able to forward an introductory email that I wrote describing the project, who I was, um, why I wanted to make it, and then um, eight of the 12 um, students that had accepted MIT's admission offer that year, they were all class of 2015, um, eight of them responded to my inquiry. Um, we started filming with eight and um, eventually that dwindled to four based on just who was um, kind of proactive and like taking the project in their stride and, and felt comfortable with um, kind of the level of intimacy that the project required. Before you answer uh, the second part of this question, let's uh, follow up with what author just said. What was it like? What did you think when you were being contacted by a filmmaker? Here you are. You're not even in the States yet, right? And you're, you're trying to figure out how you're going to fit in at MIT and start studying. Was this weird? Um, to be honest, it was something I really embraced from the beginning. And the reason being that getting into MIT to me just felt so amazing, felt like a miraculous experience as I describe it that like I really wanted to share that story with other people who were either from my own background or grew up in places that I grew up in. So when Arthur reached out, it all just felt to me like part of this whole massive thing, positive thing that's happening to me. And yeah, the timing, the timing felt good. So I, I, I jumped on it. And the, the last question uh, was asked, uh, you had had some depression in the film that you and she was asking your mental health now is is it good? Yeah, I'm I'm definitely in a good place. I'm happy. Um, to be honest, even though I mean in the in the film it talks about all these different things that I had experienced, my my experience at MIT was quite positive too. I had always looked at things from this lens of. Or let me put it this way, that I've always been an optimist. And so even though I had a sort of rough patches where things weren't good according to plan, it always felt to me like a massive improvement from where I had been before. And so um, from then, even through the time when I didn't get the visa through the lottery, um, I was able to go to school, get my master's, get a job, get my green card sponsored, and that's so, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm grateful. Yes, in the back. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, in the back. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'll repeat your... Uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I have a quick question for Arthur. Uh, a number of the storylines played out can probably be repeated across multiple people who have come from various African countries, especially the U.S. Um, is there thoughts around, are there any thoughts around like a, a support group or a way to tell the story and provide support for those that are going through it now in a way that learns from all the stories that are out there? 
Um, so that's something I would I would love for campuses to have screenings. Um, you know, as part of since finishing the film and kind of applying to festivals, um, I've also been encouraged to look at like kind of maybe defining within whatever scope we can we can handle an impact campaign. And so I've been trying to figure out, uh, basically reaching out to organizations that work in that international student space and trying to build relationships, share the film with them to see if um, it's something they might want to, you know, use in their work. Um, so yeah, there is some interest and we've, we're developed, we're trying to figure out what that looks like. Um, but then even outside of that, um, you know, like if you look at the, the, our social media pages are following like as many African students associations and black students unions uh, that we can find. Um, and we're hoping that they um, kind of, kind of hopefully they connect with the film, they get to see it at some point, maybe during the PBS broadcast, although I don't, I don't know if students, uh, current students actually watch PBS. So I think we might actually have to bring the film to them somehow, but it would be great to have, my dream is to really have um, in 2024, next year, at least in the US, um, a campus tour where um, on every campus, the African Students Association, the Black Students Union, the LGBT rights um, group or the LGBT community group, um, if it's a women's group or like a women's studies de department um, or gender studies department could kind of co-host um, a screening and then, you know, use, use the screening as a platform to like reflect on, on, on people's experiences. Um, yes, but there are limits to what we can do because as an independent filmmaker, we really, and, and you know, uh, the participants, we really pushed it felt like a sufficient, is that what the, the word uh, is? Yeah. You know, task, you're just like pulling, pushing this um, giant boulder up the mountain. And it's exciting to finally have the film. Uh, it'd be great to find partners to kind of help um, make use of it and, and create the impacts that it could have in the world. <laughs> so please tell people, and maybe that's a good point to actually say that, um, you know, we've kind of, this film has been, uh, um, supported by a community, a grassroots community. So I have a newsletter, you know, it's pretty low traffic, except maybe in this time, maybe I, I send an email once every two weeks because we're in like the festival circuits and like things are happening. Um, so there's a sign, a few sign up sheets. If you want to join the community, please uh, drop your email. Um, it's all in my care and I send updates occasionally, um, but you can be part of the impact and the work that the film is doing. And then, you know, we have a website, briefedandthelightfilm.com, social media, if you're on, on that as well. Um, tell people about it, please. The sign-up sheets are in the lobby um, on clipboards. Yeah. So, yeah. oh, yes, I'm sorry, right here? Yep. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, certainly thank you for the commendable film. Um, I wondered, uh, as I looked at it, that you, you gave us some sociological antecedents, expectations of parents, etc., of the, the, the students you chose, legal antecedents, the British laws, respect to homosexuality, etc., etc. But we got nothing of the high schools and the elementary schools, the academic antecedents. We, we had that it was a miracle to enter MIT. Well, what enabled was there something there? We, we think of our students in Lexington High School as, you know, they are coming from exceptional backgrounds, academic backgrounds, etc. So could you comment a bit on that? Uh, I, I did not get it from the film. Hmm. Uh, so in case people couldn't hear, because I don't think this mic is working great, um, he's wondering what the experiences were like in the high schools in Africa, uh, because author didn't cover that piece? Great question. Thank you for um, pointing that out and asking about that. Um, I guess one thing I will say is <laughs> we covered a lot in one film. And so, and, and I mean, we shot a lot also. I mean, Philip and his brother shot um, footage in his school because, you know, whenever you go back um, 
to your home country or like you visit school, people are excited to hear about your experiences. So with every participant, we went back to their schools. Uh, there's footage of that. And there were versions of the film where you got to see them interact with, um, with students uh, or high schoolers in their, in their old high schools. And, you know, that maybe would have given some context, but we, we had to kind of hone in and kind of pick our lane and what we wanted to handle in this film. Um, and at some point I feel, I felt like maybe there is another film to be made, maybe a similar study where you're following um, uh, young, you know, teenagers in high schools in, in, in um, different countries in Africa as they're deciding where they want to go for, for college, if they want to go, you know, maybe some go um, to uh, colleges on the continent and some go abroad. Um, for example, like, you know, the Africa Leadership University, it was really exciting um, to learn about it. There are other universities that are doing really interesting things. Um, so anyway, I, I don't know if I can really answer your question um, concisely about, you know, what happened within the high school years. Maybe maybe Philip can comment. And actually, he does have a line a little bit about um, getting access to a scholarship, right? Yes, yeah. And Philip, as, as you talk about this, I'm wondering, like, where did MIT come in to your mind? How was it even introduced as a possibility? Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll try to, to summarize it quickly. Um, I would say I came to MIT with a pretty like solid STEM background, math, physics, for the mathematics. And the reason for that was I went to a very, very good high school in northern Nigeria on scholarship. Um, and so at that high school, we were exposed to, there's this subject called further mathematics. So typically the students who take further mathematics and excel in it will pretty much have kind of like AP level exposure to like calculus and whatnot. Um, so, but um, the story of how I finished MIT, um, rather how I finished high school in Nigeria and then ended up in the US um, happened because I was part of a program at the US embassy in Nigeria, um, specifically every year they offer like 15 slots to students within the country, within the northern part of the country, and then another 15 slots to students from the southern part, give them the opportunity to take SATs, and those who excel in that get to apply to American schools. And um, if you apply to an American school, you get admitted and you have enough funding, they will cover the cost of bringing you over. So that's the program I got into in the U.S. After, um, in Nigeria after I graduated high school. Um, there's a long story there about how I got into the program. I heard about it, but the summary of it was that um, I had taken, high school was good. I'd taken my final exams a year early. The results were really good. That's what made me qualify for the uh, program at the U.S. Embassy. And then when I got into the program, I was part of uh, 15 students, and we went through the whole process of studying for the SATs and whatnot before applying to schools in America. It was in that program that I actually heard about MIT for the first time, yes. But prior to that program, we would hear about Harvard, Oxford, all the other colleges, but not necessarily MIT. And so um, it turned out that my background was solid enough, my grades were excellent and everything, and so I was encouraged to apply. Arthur, did you have a similar experience in Ghana? Um, some similarities, but um, some differences as well. Um, so I would say I learned about MIT because um, there were schoolmates that had gone to MIT and kind of had sent the word back um, that this is how you, there's an opportunity here. You know, you write, there's an exam called the SAT and you can write it and you can, you know, we couldn't afford the, uh, the cost of the SATs, but then we learned that you could do waivers, you could apply for waivers. Um, and yeah, and so people had kind of paved the path and sent information back, but the U.S. Embassy did have um, a service. You had to pay a fee to subscribe 
um, basically it was like a library where you got <clears throat> the um, the school right the college rankings from uh, the U.S. News and World Report. Um, so there's a book, and then there were books on um, you know how to apply to college. You know the samples of essays that were good. You know um, show don't tell. <laughs> you know all of that, and uh, there was a service of basically. You know, you, you'd get time in the library to research what schools might be interesting to you. You would come up with a, like a top 50 list. And then you'd have a meeting, a 30 minute meeting or so with a guidance counselor type person within the U.S. Um, it's called USIS. Did you have that? U.S. Information Services or something like that? Something, something. slightly different name, but okay. yeah, something similar. Yeah, and so it's like a guide, high school guidance um, counseling service, I imagine, uh, here. And in that meeting, um, I remember them basically telling me that, oh, so you also have to fill out a form about how much um, financial support your family could provide. So they look at the numbers and they said, well, you can't afford any of the 50 colleges you've listed, <laughs> you know, the arts and all that stuff, but your transcripts are exceptional, so you should look at, you know, like the top tier universities because they have scholarships, for they have um, financial aid for international students because most of the other, you know, American colleges might have financial aid for Americans, but not for internationals. So it's the Harvards, the MITs, um, and so I ended up applying to like, 10 like Ivy League schools at MIT. Okay. <laughs> that's an interesting process. 50, that's huge. <laughs> yes, right in the middle here. Yeah. Uh, actually, I don't need a uh, microphone. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. This was amazing. Um, I, so U5 had all this um, unbelievable pressure as you came to college, like, I have to save my family, I have to save my village, I have to save my country. When I went to college, I only thought about myself. I wasn't saved anybody. And um, so uh, it was fascinating to see how you worked that journey and how you tried to make peace along the way with the, the changing decisions. And you know, it's a very complicated thing. And I look at you two and you have kind of honored that journey. You built relationships here, and through your work and the relationships here, you've been able to impact not only life here, you're making life better here by showing us this film, for one thing, mm -hmm. but I think also to your home countries. And my small city of Malden, which is three, three towns away, where almost 50% foreign-born were hyper-diverse. 60 languages are spoken at our high school. And we're probably what the US is gonna look like in, in the future. And I feel like there's a lot of mixing between the school kids, because they're all at school together, but I'm not sure there's much with the adults. So it's like all these different groups, right? Coexisting peacefully and everything. But I feel like what if we could do a much better job relationship building and community building because these are like my neighbors they live down the street and I think about all the problems we have in America and all the problems we have in all these other countries we have thousands of Haitians that live in Malden why do we send an NGO that thinks they're going to go fix Haiti they don't even talk to the people and they build stuff and leave and it's like wait what if we could partner here. I don't know. I'd just be curious to know. I'm sure you guys probably have thought a lot about that, but I'm, I'm wondering how can you do that, you know? So I just want to um, make a comment. Um, Marcel, was, uh, we were just having a conversation last night, and uh, it's actually very, uh, it, it's hubris to think that we can go into other countries and make decisions. We are white people uh, that um, do not know other cultures, and we don't know what what other cultures and countries need, and do you do you echo that? And do you think about that idea of like how changes can be made in your countries? Do you feel like that's partly why the the weight was so heavy on your shoulders when you came over to 
get the experience, the leadership, the, the knowledge, the skills to go back because you, in effect, could make the differences in your own country? <laughs> These are big questions. Um, I don't know, I guess the only thing I will say, because I, I, I don't know if I can really answer those questions, but I, I will say that maybe we get rid of borders um, because there's a part of me that sees, you know, like these borders that we have, countries, and um, this moment, you know, with the, the visas, the visa thing. Um, some people are let in and some are not, and you know, the, the parameters are very. It could be looked, could be seen as exploitative um, in some ways, and I feel like historically there's been a siphoning of resources from one place to another, and then you know that place gets very wealthy and then sets up borders and sets up um, uh, barriers to entry for certain kinds of people that are deemed acceptable. Um, and so there's a part of me that wonders about like trying to fill a basket with water when there are all these holes <laughs> that we maintain it. So anyway, that's, that's the comment I will make. It may be something to consider. Did you want to comment on that or do you want to go? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a little I heavy. Yeah, I, I don't really have much to add other than to say, I'm, I'm just trying to just think through your own question of what's the motivation to want to impact people back home is. Um, I don't necessarily see it from the lens of, oh, foreigners are coming into Nigeria and are causing more problems than they're solving. I say it more as um, it's great that we have people with the right kind of like intention to want to do good. Maybe the process needs to be better. Um, the process needs to be better in multiple different ways. I don't necessarily have the answers to all of it, but I know that from my own personal experience of being in the US, even because I've been away for since 2011, I've spent most of my time in the US. If I wanted to go back to Nigeria to do anything, I typically have to involve the people who have been on ground for that period because a lot of things have changed. So looking at it from that angle, I would say um, if folks who do projects abroad were to involve folks with local context a bit more, maybe outcomes would be better. Um, but for my own motivation, my motivation is a bit different. It comes more from my own kind of like lived experiences in Nigeria, growing up in that environment, seeing the things that went wrong that are very, very clear to me that if I could do something slightly different, where that experience of wanting to do something slightly different comes from being in the US and seeing the better ways things are done. Um, Arthur was there multiple times when, at least over the course of my undergrad, I did go home to try to teach, and then I went right back after my bachelor's degree as well to do the same thing. And I have friends who are doing the same across different schools, where the goal is to say, okay, we might not be able to do much today, but what if we teach people? What if we impart knowledge? Maybe one or two things you say might inspire someone to change their path or do things different. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm never, not sure that I answered that question, but... I think we can never um, uh, think that uh, the smallest of things uh, are very important. We can never, uh, never forget that. We have time for a few more questions. Do we have anyone? Yes. Could everybody hear? Yeah. Okay. Um, that's Cleo, who designed the beautiful poster and our graphics. Uh, so. Very beautiful. <laughs> very beautiful. Um, um, 
Yeah, it's been exciting to kind of see people react to the film. Um, we were just in um, in Newport Beach, California, where we did a California premiere, and you know there were people. Oh, somebody said <laughs> they were crying throughout the the, the movie. Um, and you know, a lot of um, times I hear, you know, this is better than I expected because I've never seen our story kind of up on the screen and this resonates so much. Um, there was a doctor here earlier, I think he left, um, who heard our interview on WBR, B-U-R, and decided, you know, to take a nap and then come to the, to the screen because, you know, because like, wait, this is my story. I want to, I actually want to see how they, they um, how it, you know, it, it turns out. Um, so there's been the African, you know, students, former students um, uh, that have seen it, that have really s said, you know, it's very authentic and it speaks to, to them. Um, but there's also the comments that I've had from Americans who maybe, you know, it's not the primary experience, um, but, you know, this idea of we see international students all, all the time, but we never really get to know them. And this is giving us a window um, to get closer to them. So there's, you know, there's been some great uh, conversations we've had. Uh, there was actually um, a schoolmate from Ghana who also did that journey of, you know, coming to study. And um, he saw it at the Tacoma Film Festival. He came out to see it. And we, after that, you know, we talked about so many things. But one of the stories that stuck with me was, you know, he's a straight uh, man and he really related to the discomfort uh, about, you know, he can't be his full self um, in the US. He needs to, you know, kind of make himself not threatening to people. Um, uh, he can't express himself in ways that are, you know, anyway, he can't be him, his full self. But when he gets on the plane, he gets to Ghana, it feels like a weight, um, uh, is released off his shoulders, right? And so he can be as loud as he wants, he can be as joyful and express himself. And he said he never imagined that for me, in some ways, it's the opposite. As a gay Ghanaian, you know, I get, a, I get on a plane and I go back to the closet a little bit or a lot <laughs> in some ways. You know, there's, um, you know, so he, he, he brought that up and he's like, you know, like in some ways the tables are kind of, switched in that and he never thought of that so anyway we thought we had a long conversation about a lot of things but that was one of them so it's really kind of resonating with people which is um really gratifying and a big honor across uh genders um uh and uh ethnicities i mean i know when i saw this film i have a lot you know i have a number of friends uh, that are people of color and uh, I have to say, like with Marcel, when I went to college, I was just thinking about myself and what am I going to do? What's going to make me happy? And I didn't have that weight on my shoulders. And I found when I was watching all, all of the three times that I've watched this film, it's like it impacts me tremendously because I thought I understood what it was like for people to come over to this country and study from the African continent but I didn't get it at all. And you captured, you really captured it so beautifully and sharing, you know, these experiences, Philip, I mean, it just, it helps us all to better understand one another. And it's, it's really the name of the game. Do we have, oh, we've got a couple more. Okay, um, the lady in the back. Um, such a beautiful film, Arthur, and um, I loved so many things about it, but one thing I particularly loved was the thematic thread of how um, some of the most important and transformative aspects of an MIT education are not the equations or the, or the technical, you know, um, uh, aspects. And, and you talked about uh, liking the, or loving the writing classes. Um, and I, so I wondered what you would, how, how you would say the writing short stories informs the making of this film? I mean, is it the same process? Is it 
the same because that you know how are those part of the same artistic effort for you? Thank you, Helen. This is Helen Elaine Lee, an incredible writer and incredible teacher. She's my mentor. Um, I took fiction writing with her. Um, and, and one of the lines that um, has always stayed with me that I learned from Helen is make sure that your writing is grounded in the concrete. Um, and so, you know, like make sure it's, it's, it's got the human experience in there. Um, and she's got an incredible new book that's doing amazing. Check out Pomegranate. Um, thank you, Helen, for supporting through all these years as well. Um, she helped kind of open doors at MIT as well. Um, but to answer your question, um, I think the similarities might be in editing a sequence. Um, you know, a short story, I feel like, you know, when I wrote short stories, I haven't <laughs> written a short story in a while. Um, there was always this kind of moment of inspiration and back at MIT it would happen when I have, I had an exam the next day and then, you know, you're studying at 11 PM and all of a sudden you get like, you get possessed by this idea and this like breakthrough and then you have to write. <laughs> so rather than studying for your, you know, like physics, final, whatever, you write a short story uh, for Helen's class. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank you, Helen. Um, so I feel like um, the sequences, you know, like the movements in um, in the film are kind of like that because you kind of build um, a beginning, middle, and end within kind of a chapter. And then you build the next one and then later you figure out how they might um, go from one to the next. Um, so there are similarities there, I would say. And obviously, like the revision, you know, you go back and revise um, all the time. That's what I can think of right now. One more. Okay. Oh, well, two more. Okay, right here. Um, I thank you, Arthur, for uh, making this film. I, um, I'm incredibly moved. I feel the, the, the stories of, of the, the people that you know, you, Philip, and, and the others. I am in awe of uh, your character, and I feel like I would want to learn from you, <laughs> you all. And there's so much beauty and sort of the integrity and the, um, the pressure you felt and the, the different cycles, you know, the mood swings and things that they went through and persevered and, and yet, in my opinion, yeah, you all are leaders, and so much, so many young people could learn from you. I mean, we don't have so much, I mean, it depends on what families you're coming from, but there's the hardship that some people face is very little, you know, and, and so maybe the character isn't deepened, but perhaps we can learn from each other. And um, in any case, I guess my question, or I'm wondering if, if you can take it to high schools and have discussion. I think that would be so valuable and, um, and it can sort of turn the tables to, you know, what, what can we learn from you, you know? But thank you so much for this, it was incredible. Thank you so much. Um, we are looking at educational, we're talking to a couple of educational distributors, um, so they have the infrastructure to take it to public libraries, to make it um, easily licensable to high schools and colleges and, and all of that. Um, and then, you know, we'll set up the infrastructure for, you know, somebody, if an entity or a school wants to have a screening and then, you know, bring Philip or Fidelis or Sante or myself or somebody else affiliated with a with the, uh, the film to like speak or be part of um, the conversation, you know, we'll have that um, as a possibility as well. Perfect. Uh, okay, here. Yes, I, I'd just like to say a uh, couple things uh, to Arthur. Thank you for your perseverance. Um, you know, obviously it was a long film and, and, and going that, I mean, you, you, that's a long road to, to go on that and to each of the people participating. So. And you, you really have a, a, a 
powerful film with just many different layers, and it was just it was just very uh, fascinating to see all the things going on and, and the processing of things, and just I, I mean, and some of the metaphors struck like the like time marches on, and you see the the river and where they're being led, and the, the golden cups, like just but just but and then being alone in such personal moments in their rooms, like, um, it was just, a, it's an extremely powerful film along a lot of different layers. Um, I know um, we talked about the writing. I, I was gonna ask one question. Um, Maxwell's equations, differential form or <laughs> integral form. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Little MIT. You know, <laughs> now, what I was gonna ask is, um, on just expectations, like you set out, maybe, I, I don't know, like how, like when you look back, how is the film different looking at it now than maybe when you were thinking about it when you started? Thank you for those, those comments. Um, and I'd like to actually also point out that, you know, while, you know, I was patient and I persevered, but Philip, Sante, oh, yeah. Billy, yeah, Fidelis also persevered. I mean, it was at least eight years of like filming, of me asking for their time and them giving and them actually filming and then their families participating and supporting. And then also their patience with kind of the post-production process because I would come back and bother them for X, Y, and Z when they were busy living, you know, starting companies and starting families and all of that. Um, and there was always um, a mutual respect and the, and the, and the, and the, and the grace, you know? So um, thank you for giving the world basically um, this beautiful thing. Um, and then your question was, before and after, like oh, before and out, after. Like Actually, when, when you see it now, yeah, is it different versus your expectation? I think this was the film I was chasing from the very beginning because when um, Kelly Creedon, you know, the the editor that recut it and basically accomplished this film version, um, when she started working on it in March 2022 last year. Um, I gave her my latest, my proposal at that time, so basically an outline of what I thought the film, the story was. And then I also found the very first outline that I, I, I created back in 2011. And I sent them to her and she read them and she was like, oh, it's great to see that, you know, your vision has stayed consistent. You know, like the, some of the details, um, you know, obviously because the, the story was clarified after we filmed it. Um, but in terms of what I was chasing, this is the film. And so once we got this version, in my guts, I knew we had we had realized what I knew the potential of the story could be. Well, I want to end this evening by saying um, that Alberto and I we travel, and when we travel, we um, when we leave wherever we are, we kind of are sad because we're leaving a little piece of ourselves. It feels a little bit like home. And I just hope, I see the hearts of both of you. You guys are wonderful. And I think that, you know, we are blessed by you uh, having chosen the U.S. as your home and we're your neighbors. And I think that we're the lucky ones. So I hope yeah. you feel as welcome uh, as I would like you to feel, uh, and that is wholeheartedly. So thank you, and the best of luck with this film. The best of luck to you, Bob, I also want to say thank you, April and Alberto, and the Arlington International Film Festival for creating this space, for honoring this film, for convening this wonderful audience um, to to give us a chance to share it with you and for supporting our work since 2016, Nitro Beta, um, uh, up, 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 up until this moment. It feels like a family, um, so thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.